I want to see that perfect. Great. Okay, we're going to go over to the chat. There you go. Perfect. All right, so today it is online Puppy Start Right group classes, classes live, so we can see and hear you at any time. If you'd like, you can remove your video, no problem, or your audio should be turned off um, just so that we can get some of this information out here. Um, we have a theme that we do every single week. So this week's theme is costumes and appearances so that your puppy can get um, acclimated to the sight of a mask that people are all wearing, right? And costumes going forward in um, um, Halloween. Oops. Um, I'm Yora Medeiros. I'm the owner and founder of Canine Learning Academy. And he this is. I'm Julie Fryman. I'm one of the head trainers and I'm one of the managers at Canine Learning Academy. And together we put together 100% of the online content and the videos and what you're going to see. We spend a lot of time in the background putting these presentations together. So we hope that you get a lot out of it and feel free to ask as many questions as you like. Yeah. Uh, the class is instructional on Tuesday. It's a human only class. So what that means is that we're going to be giving you a lot of information. If you have a spiral notebook, you can write it down. Otherwise, just know that all, all of the content of the class is going to be recorded. And then we have a platform that we're going to share with you a little bit later on where all these recordings are so you can watch them at any time. This makes it easier for you to have everyone in the house on the same page so that you're not having to repeat yourself over and over. If you've got kids, a husband, right? Another family member that's involved in your dog's life, we recommend taking that link and sharing it with them so that they can also get the information and that you guys can all be on the same page. The class runs for four weeks. So classes are every Tuesday and Thursday. So this class is just for humans, but Thursday is where you bring your dog with you and you're going to be doing the um, exercises and the behaviors right in front of us and you're gonna get coaching right through the screen. So right through here, we've had a lot of success because your puppy's not distracted by the other dogs in class, right? So you're gonna get a lot more done than you would in a normal um, class that's maybe taught kind of indoors. Yeah. yeah. Um, because this class is live, you can ask as many questions as you like. You're probably not the only one that has this question. And every four weeks, so there's eight classes total, every four weeks it repeats. So you can join at any time. So if you've got family or friends or are just picking up a puppy and you'd like them to get involved, um, just send them the link to the class or you can give us, a, a, you know, give them our cell phone number and we'll tell them how to get enrolled. But the class is completely free and you get a certificate after being um, in class for four weeks. So the Puppy Start Right curriculum is based on one of the Karen Pryor Academy programs. It is specifically for puppies eight to 20 weeks because we understand that that is the, the developmental stage of a puppy. And we want to make sure that you are, you understand and you can implement a socialization and a positive exposure to new things so that your dog doesn't become fearful later on. Um, we do have, I'm going to send you today a link to a private Facebook group page where all of these videos are going to be streaming live. We'll also have a master coaching class where you can come in and just kind of get more information. This week's topic is going to be on clicker training. And if you see here on this picture that says puppy start right on the right hand side, it says book now. That's the button that you'll push if you'd like to schedule a free one to one strategy call. So if you have a problem with, let's just say, potty training, or what's the most common that we've gotten so far? Crying in yeah. the crate, yeah. crying in the crate, or it's just too painful, or I'm not sleeping enough. Just every puppy parent in the whole world goes through the same hard week, maybe exception one or two. So please reach out to us. We know it's hard. Having a puppy is hard, but it gets a lot easier with help and support. So that's yeah. what we're here for. <laughs> And in that one-to-one -one strategy call, we will send you a treatment plan. It will say something like step one, step two, do this, do this, so that you can just take a deep breath 
and go, yeah. okay, I'm going to get through this. The puppy stage is very, very short. We understand the importance of trying to get through it. It's not easy, especially if you've never done it before. It's way harder than people imagine. And especially if you're um, pressured to do it correctly. So here's what you're going to learn in this program. You're going to learn about all the different developmental stages so that you're more understanding of, oh, my dog is going through puberty. Yeah. Okay. That's why they're, they, they warned me about this, right? Body language so that you can tell if your dog is okay or a little bit stressed out so that you can make those judgment calls. We're gonna teach you how to socialize and expose your dog positively in this world that we live in right now. We are here in Sunset Beach, California. We had a mandatory um, lockdown or curfew last, last night, night at so. four o'clock in Long Beach. It caused a little bit of chaos for our business. Lots of loud noises. We heard gunshots like, last night in Long Beach. Gunshots, uh, we heard fireworks. So um, where we are is a very high condensed population. So we have to be prepared for lots of those noise. This is not the first time that we've ever heard gunshots in no. this area. Um, so we have to be really prepared for noise sensitivity um, and exposure to big crowds and big groups. So we're going to talk about how we can do that safely right now because you, I know you have a lot of questions about post COVID-19 yeah. and, and how we're doing this. We're going to teach you how to problem solve on your own and how to prevent the unwanted behaviors that are going to occur later on if you're not careful. If you don't have that management plan in place, um, you're going to get problems. The problems that you're having now as a puppy, this is what, you know, the letting your puppy go on the bed, letting your puppy jump up on you when they're very young may not be a big deal now, but when those two black labs are 120 pounds <laughs> each, it's a huge problem. It's a problem where it could really be, hurt someone. Hurt, yeah. yeah. Um, the other things we're going to work on today is enrichment and physical um, exercise. We're going to talk about breed specific because each breed has a specific task that they need to do. And then we're just going to show you how to do some of the basic foundations. So again, this week, theme is costumes and appearances, which is going to be fun. So here are all the subjects that we're going to go over today. We are going to talk about the ever dreaded chewing. I know that your puppies have super sharp teeth and we're going to talk about why they do and how we can help with that, um, as well as talking about the vital importance of uh, enrichment. And most importantly, we are going to talk about the biggest influence on your dog's behavior throughout their lifetime, which is the socialization period from three to 12 weeks. We do have 16 weeks on there for our larger breeds, large to giant breeds. They develop a little more slowly, so you're going to have a little bit more time, but the average is between three and 12 weeks that you have to expose your puppy to everything to everything your that's going to be your world. a part of your your life in the next um five to ten years you know don't just think how can i get through these next six months think about the dog that you want for your family in 10 years because hopefully you're going to have a long and healthy life with your dog that you can build together right now so these are the eight stages that your dog will go through we're gonna pick one, which is the socialization stage, and we're gonna kind of zone in on that and specifically tell you what that means. But understand that your dog will continue to change and alter. So some of the puppies that we have in our all-day school program, they usually graduated about 16 or 20 weeks. Yeah. And then the good dog goes through another stage and we get calls again, you know. So it's important to know that their stage is just like, just like children, right? They go through their terrible twos and then their adolescent and then their teenage stage and then the you don't know anything stage. <laughs> so it's, uh, it's true. Totally. So between three and 12 weeks, we have the ultimate chance to influence your dog's temperament, which is what, I mean, I think the number- How would you describe temperament? Yeah, the number one goal of, you know, when people say, my dog is so sweet, or he's so gentle, or he's cuddly, or affectionate, these are things that we hear about 
temperament. I also hear my dog's a jerk or stubborn. Or, my dog is really stubborn. <laughs> so we want to gear towards that. My dog is so gentle and wonderful and he's very sweet. And we have that opportunity during the first four months, mostly three months to build a puppy with confidence who's adaptable to different situations, that is not a guarantee with humans or with dogs, yeah. um, and is able to become an emotionally stable adult. And what we mean by that is getting out all of that overreactive potential, like barking and lunging at the end of the leash, we can often trace those problems back directly to, to this stage, this particular stage right here. So um, reactivity to dogs and people, fear of people, places and things, very, very common. Um, anxiety related problems, separation anxiety, um, you know, whining and barking in the crate throughout the lifetime, and then nuisance behaviors, using their body and their mouth to get your attention by jumping and chewing and stealing and barking. These are all really common dog behaviors, but we can manage and prevent them very early during this stage of your puppy's life. I just got a call um, about a client that we're working with. The um the parent of the, the puppy passed away. Mm. So the sister had to take over the dog and the dog goes outside in this new house in the new front yard and is, is crying and literally barking and showing teeth at everything. Mm. So as we ask the right questions, we come to find out that during this stage, her veterinarian had told her, do not go outside. And that's, that's at least what she said to me. She said, vet said, can't go outside until he's completely vaccinated, which is was 16 to 20 weeks for this puppy. And she missed this entire stage. And that's very common. common yeah. Either they over scare you or it's a misunderstanding. Whatever is happening, they they still need to go out your front door. We're going to show you how. We're going to show yeah, you yeah. how to do that safely. Does anyone's vet said this to them that like, do don't not go, go outside, outside until your dog's completely vaccinated. Let us know. Can you just put in your little chat if this was ever said to you, if it's say yes or no? Yes. yes. Okay. Not even outside. Wow. So what they're supposed to say in modern veterinarians will say something like, um, don't let your dog be exposed to areas that are high traffic for animals. That's what they're supposed to say. Oh, some no. said just the backyard. Some said, yeah. no, I'm seeing a lot of no's, which is good that your vets are preparing. That is what my vet said. Okay. Yeah. So that's not, I'm not going to technically say that that's wrong or right. I'm just saying there's another way. If you don't let your dog be exposed during this stage of time, your dog most likely, this is what we get now later on, besides our puppies, we've got a lot of reactive dogs. They become reactive because they're afraid because they weren't exposed when they can actually go, oh, that's okay. That's pretty safe. Instead, they're just emotionally shut down and they're afraid. And then changing that is like, a lot longer. yeah, it's like asking someone who's afraid to fly to change that feeling. You, you really feel that way. Mm -hmm. And to change that feeling, it's going to take time or hypnosis or something, right? <laughs> so, and then you'll be coming back to us much later. So let's go into how to socialize your pet safe puppy safely. So you must take your puppy out into the world, but of course we're not saying to um, put them in yeah. any danger or even put them down on the ground, which I know can be kind of hard for the bigger dogs. So use resources like a shopping cart, lay a towel down. You can see Bodie is here and we're just sniffing and smelling. And this is inside of a pet store. So he's being exposed to shopping carts, food, animals. There's all kinds of animals in a pet store. Um, but the sight, sound, and um, smell, smell of everything of it. without touching the ground. So socialization yeah. is more than just touch. It involves all of your senses. Yeah. So putting them in a wagon, you can see this pretty picture of Yo. Mm -hmm. She's got the, the puppy in a little wrap, like a little papoose. They make tote bags. They make backpacks. They make slings. You can see this is the, probably the cutest thing that we do as trainers 
is put them on our chest. Do you want to talk about this puppy? So this is my board and train that I picked up two days ago. The parents were just, they probably are on, I can't tell, but they were just like, this is, this is a lot of work. So especially because they just couldn't go out at the level that they wanted, they needed to in order for this dog to be comfortable with the real world. So this is me walking along the beach with my two other dogs that I have. One is mine, one's another pet sitting dog. And we are exposing these dogs, this puppy to what life could be like, right? So over here on the right, we had a, a construction area. So I stopped to let them take it in and see these big green machines before they're moving. While on the beach, um, I let him actually put his, there was a little thing that, you know, goes across. I let him put his feet in the sand for a second. This is an opportunity to expose your puppy in a very patient, safe way to get all that, that stimulus in, right? And I'm watching his body language. I'm able, he's able to take food. So I know he's not that stressed. And to be honest, like this little carrier at first, it's not, it's not something that most dogs like, but if you're generous with your food. He keeps falling asleep yeah. in it. He like, really, he puts his head down and just like a little baby, he yeah. just falls right asleep in it. And it's really sweet. So it does take a little adjustment, but it's totally worth it. And in this contactless world that we live in, this keeps your face and your hands safe and you can still go out and let Life. your puppy be out in the I like world. this carrier mm -hmm. for people that have a dog that is on the higher level of like like your Aussie doodle something like that yeah. so like this puppy is very confident so that's why I feel comfortable if this dog was really shy the shire dog is actually easier for me to manage inside my home because they don't want to move very much. But for that dog that's like you would call stubborn and like wants to get out of their, their pin and stuff, having a carrier like this, now you can wash dishes, now you can do stuff around the house and you're not feeling like you're trapped. You can technically work out holding <laughs> your dog like this. I literally did lateral lunges, squats, rear lunges, Ooh, all a and I went five pound yeah. weight on you. Well he's not even five pounds. He's only but three. I love that. So talking about so this one is specifically for um our friend oh I already forgot your anyone that has a puppy that um doesn't have another litter mate Puppy play, human play is really important. Katie, so this is for you. Listen up. <laughs> Sorry, I'm just spaced out for a second. Being, getting down on the ground. Now, I want to caveat so this at first and saying this is a, an adult only playtime. We do not involve kids in this particular one because there's no rules. So dogs, right now, especially we don't have access to all the, you know, lots play of puppies days. and dogs. So to make sure that our dogs know how to play properly, and a, we see so many like socially awkward dogs just approach other dogs in these very awkward Too ways. Close. Face to yeah. face, they bowl over them. So teaching mm -hmm. them what appropriate body language is and how to initiate play with another dog, you're going to be their best puppy friend. And that's good for more than just exercising your dog. The more of a best friend yeah. in, a, in a parenting kind of way. So the more of the best friend you are, if you're that, that sibling that that dog always wanted, your dog is more likely to listen to you. So if you have two dogs, it's important that human play is done with each dog separately so that they don't bond with just each other. You hear it, we've got clients in our other class, they've got dogs that are so bonded, there's a, like a belching scream when they're separated. And then they don't listen to the human yeah. at all. They're so stressed out that they can't, their hearing turns off. So teaching your puppy, just like you would let little kids go to a playground, right? There's, there's rules, but it's very, very relaxed, meaning you're going to be down on the ground. You're pretending to, to kind of push. And this was a very shy puppy, but just kind of getting my hands down, moving them around. She's allowed, I'm using a leash just to keep her in the area. 
But you're watching body language. If you can record what we call human play, you will be doing this Thursday. This is a great way to bond with your puppy. It's a great way for your dog to learn bite inhibition. There is no rules. You see Julie's hair is up. She's wearing a long sleeve. If the dog goes over and you know accidentally nibbles on her hair or something, you just want to be mindful of that. Maybe take note, but you don't want to say no or have any any rules that stop it because you're wanting the dog to really be themselves. We, the first, we recommend this with rescue dogs too, oh, since sure. the rescue dog really, you don't know what you have for the first three months. Get but on if the, floor. the first time they put their mouth on you, they've never done it in a playful way, it's going to hurt. And if they're not practicing that inhibition somehow, it's going to escalate, especially if you have children, because what happens is they bite too hard, your kid goes, ow, and then pulls away and drops something, and then that puppy learns that that worked. If, that that worked. And that's yeah. what they're thinking. They're not aggressive, they're not trying to be mean. They're thinking, wow, that worked, that got me my treat really yeah. fast. I bet I could do that again. And so, this is normal for puppies to put their mouth on you. This is what they did with their litter mates, right? It's how they explore the world. It's the only way they know to explore the world. So be forgiving understand that it's going to happen prepare by wearing long sleeves putting but, your jeans on not your tight lulu cute lemon pants yeah. that they can chew and pull a hole in or wear some you know fitted clothes so they can't grab on to dangles and that kind of stuff and human play should be done every day every day, every day for bonding get on but the just floor for, you know one and a half to two minutes. Two That's minutes. It. <laughs> We're not saying do this for 30 yeah. minutes because then they will be overstimulated. Yeah. Just get down and do a two minute. That puppy's Every day. like passed out immediately after that. So it's a great bonding. Experience. Okay. So on your chat, um, I want you to get ready to type, put your fingers on the keyboard. And does anyone have a food bowl put yes or no? And if you have a food bowl, maybe you could put ceramic, stainless steel. Yes. Okay. Yes. Ceramic. ceramic. Okay. Cool. No, got nope. rid of it. Yes. Yeah, that's our niche. <laughs> yeah. Stainless. Not, Not yet. yet. Okay. Okay. So we're going to ask, and you're going to see when you join our private page, we're going to be a lot, we're going to talk a lot about enrichment project. The enrichment project is the concept of ditching the standard feeding bowl and making feeding time more meaningful, meaning challenging your dog's brain, getting them to use their mouth to, you know, to get them to find their food. If you've got a dog that loves to sniff, find a sniffing, make a sniffing project. If your dog is a terrier and he likes to rip shit up, find a way to put something in where like a cardboard box yeah, or you know, shredded paper, let him, you know, rip up a, a toilet paper roll. You're going to throw it away anyway. Yeah. Let your puppy have that positive outlet. You know, I got a text from um, Sarah who just said that she completely ditched the bowl. Her puppy is three months old and is problem solving like an adult dog because she ditched the bowl. So it's pretty remarkable how it can start to change their thinking and their energy as well. This is a um, muffin tin, and these are two of the puppies we were working with at the same time. They're board and train. Um, stainless steel is sometimes tough for a dog, especially if they have a little dingling charm that like hit it and yeah. it's much louder for them because it's right close to so it. we have a little bit of different texture in each hole but it gives your dog a sense of like oh well what's in this one what's in this one it's literally a puzzle mm -hmm. this one on the left Sorry. is for the for i had three i think i had three dogs with me at the time but i am making um and making their meals out of these little things that you can find on Amazon. We'll share the links with you, but these are our favorites because you can put and stuff their food, whether it's wet, raw. I have one little frozen peanut butter and yogurt cookie that I put on the tops. There was a lot of different textures going on. And this, how long did it take them to finish their meals? About 30 minutes. Yeah. yeah. And how much more fun was it than just like scarfing the whole thing? Yeah. And for people that want to go work out in the morning, this is what you're working towards is having your dog use this time to mentally stimulate them 
while you go take a shower and finally brush your teeth for the first time, right? Like blow dry your yeah. hair and, you know, get ready for your day by getting your dog mentally exhausted so that you can, you don't feel so bad when you have to leave them yeah. for a couple of hours and be on the computer. If you have multiple dog household, you do want to use management until those dogs do not have any resource guarding. We have worked with these several of dogs, um, these groups of two, and we are, we can confirm that they don't have any resource guarding and they're accepting mm -hmm. of other animals near them. So we're gonna challenge you to ditch the bowl. On Thursday, we're going to ask you to bring something specific and we're going to be doing a project like this right in front of us. Here is the puppy that I have in Border Train right now. This, again, I've only had him for 48 hours. He is already, since we have three meals a day, I do half of his meal for training, and I do the other half to give him a project. And he's literally just going like, what's next, what's next, what's next? And I did this in front of the other two dogs that I have in the home, and he could care less. So you think about that. That dog is staying with his food in the presence of other dogs, he's gonna have a positive exposure to those other big animals, right? And on the very bottom, I'm using his food to teach him a sit pretty at nine weeks old. That's How cute, cute is this? So cute. And he's enjoying it and loving it. So sit pretty, sit down, go touch, recall. He's already got like eight different behaviors that we've put on cue just from using mealtime. Here's your socialization checklist, guys. This is what you've got to get through before your puppy is out of this stage so that your dog is comfortable with the world and doesn't go crazy every time he sees something brand new. So what I hear a lot is, oh, my dog doesn't care about the blow dryer. But we want to make sure that it's not just a neutral, like, I don't care. We want to make sure that every experience is super positive, that they have a great association with it. Because a neutral or no response can very easily be it turned could, yeah. into a bad Especially response. Especially if it's louder or something yeah. like that. So what is coming in the upcoming months that might be something that you want to expose your dog to right now? that can really set, I know if you've had animals before. Yes, yes good Lori. job, Lori. So on Thursday, we will be using the sound of fireworks to expose your dog to that sound right now because you've got four weeks to go from the very, very low volume to the high, you know, grunting sound of what fireworks actually sounds like. Right. By starting now, you've got a good 30 days to get your dog exposed. And that still might not be enough time, but at least do your diligence and do your part. And those of you thinking of going to a 4th of July party with your puppy, don't please do don't. it. No. Please don't. Even if they sound, they're like, they look like they're okay, that it's very harmful to their hearing. It can be incredibly overstimulating. And you won't be watching your animal or their body language. You'll be doing other things. So just, just please don't. It can turn be out. Be prepared really to like have somebody stay with your dogs. Yeah. We have dogs that have died on Fourth of July because they broke out of the mm -hmm. house because of the sound. It's the so. highest. Uh, the fifth of July is the highest volume of rescues, rescues and shelters yeah. because dogs run away. So. All right, so how do you socialize your dog to the site of costumes? And costumes come, in, come into your dog's life on Halloween. They come into costume like right now with everyone wearing a mask. And even someone at a drive through is a costume because they might be wearing a hat or glasses, um, an apron, scrubs, any kind of difference of clothing, even suits for guys because it makes them look very boxy and big and dark. So um, this is little Pearl getting a puppuccino, which are free at Starbucks. So if you want your dog to go with you to grab a coffee, they'll give them just a little cup of whipped cream to enjoy. And that's a positive experience right there with someone in a hat who's wearing an apron through a drive through window. And she's around another dog while she gets an errand run, so. If you dream of putting your dog in any kind of sweater or costume, um, you're going to want to, we'll get to your question one second, Claudia. 
um, you're going to want to do that early. You're going to want to expose them to it little by little and maybe do a training session or let them get into their food. So this was us at school. We had all the dogs were dressed in Halloween costumes. I was in a costume with a mask to kind of get them prepared for that. And they just did their training session. And it's, it's very awkward for a puppy to wear all this weird stuff. So you do want to do it when they're young because like Julie's dog. My dog will not, well, she's a double coat and, and she just will not tolerate being dressed up. Um, but if you do have, but she like did a, it for, for Coop. Uh, yeah. But I've, I've put sweaters on my younger dog and for me, it just, I didn't even really think of it as an option when she was younger, but, um, my golden doodle is he was very, very small. And, and I would put sweaters on him when it was colder. So, um, if you have a small dog, especially those Boston terriers with thin skin, you're going to have to put a sweater on them when you go out in the cold because they'll, they like shake. shake. Yeah. So getting them used to that now, even though it's warm outside, I know it sounds weird getting those things now and getting them used to it helps make it a possibility. So Claudia had a question. Her puppies are only six weeks old. Would you expose them to, can they have a puppuccino? Oh, that's a, probably more of a question for your vet. I would say go for it. You I'd know, say just like give them, give them a little, like little, little bit of this. Not the know. whole thing, or they probably will. But have you can also time. use something from that they are allowed to have, like their kibble, if you want to expose them that way. We're just saying use whatever your dog's motivation is in the presence of something new. So in the bottom left hand corner, this is what you're going to be doing on Thursday. You're going to be grabbing scarves and hats and glasses and masks. And while you're in the presence of your dog, you're going to put that stuff on so they know it's you. And then you can go into a play session or you can give them treats. You're going to want to be very, very generous. Um, you're going to do that a few times and progressively you might go around the corner and change something and then come back out. So this is Julie wearing a 4th of July hat, a mask, a glasses, and a hoodie, right? And you can see the puppy is... She's not going towards the dog. She's actually keeping her elbow in and the puppy's coming towards her. It's important to not over you know, like get don't it. Don't force it. Yeah. yeah. Don't force yourself on the puppy. You always want them to go at their own speed. But you could see how scary this can be for most puppies that aren't used to it. So do it now while your puppy is a, like able to take it. Do it at a distance that your dog feels comfortable. You might need to sit all the way down on the floor with your mask on and let your dog go, oh, that's you. Okay, cool. Masks are hard because you, I mean, that's why superheroes wear them. It changes your whole face, right? <laughs> it can be kind of scary. So exposing them to that now. Um, I like to put together a training program and it's day by day what you should do. So this is an example of what we recommend. Sound exposure, sight exposure, smell and touch should be done pretty much every single day. It's something that you're exposing your dog to. Field trips, we do seven days a week of field trips when we have a puppy and board and train. This dog that I have today goes everywhere, some, goes somewhere every single day, but at least three times a week coffee shop, supermarket, parking lots, Home Depot, and then your training sessions should be every single day. But if you don't have the time, a five to 10 minute training session, three times a week, at least. Okay. We're not saying do an hour. In fact, the yeah, class that don't. we have, it's, <laughs> it's, it's way too long. And in this week, is that what we're exposing? Yeah. So different people and costumes. Um, I have a puppy that uh, they have always had the UPS guy give her a treat. And he's a, he's a really big dude. He's like six, seven. He's a very strong, you know, UPS guy. And now every time this puppy sees him, she like wags her tail. She's so excited. So going up to garbage mint, our, our uh, what are they trash called? trash trash Trucks. carriers yeah. yeah um having postmen stop and just saying hey will you you can hold them just will you give me my puppy a treat or you or can treat them. while they're looking at yeah. them you give them a treat so babies toddlers women um men different facial hairs you know everything makes them look <laughs> a little bit different so any changes in people lots of different races and languages yeah, especially right now because yeah. they um they can become fearful because we look different right and that's a very natural thing that we're going to look different to them but we don't want them to be scared um due to lack i was of doing a training session with a reactive uh, dog that was overreactive and specifically to guys over 65 years old that had silver hair and was wearing a cane 
Like I'm like so, so specific. specific. So I yeah. went to Costco's parking lot looking for 65 year old men. <laughs> and I was like, maybe a couple. There was one at the bus stop. Long story short, I ended up buying a wig and getting a cane. And I, it was with Callie and I came around the corner and I was like <laughs> standing there. So we go out of our ways to make sure our dogs are exposed to what they need to. So Lindsay, your puppy is not allowed inside of the supermarket, but they can go outside around the carts and there's and then, yeah. everyone goes and buys food. So you're going to get a big diversity of people, Monday, cars. Monday at the supermarket, it's packed. And I was like, yeah. this is a great, you just sit in the parking lot or just go for a little walk holding your yeah. dog and they are taking a lot yeah. in. Yeah. Yeah. So problem prevention, um, jumping and chewing is specifically we're going to talk about, but these are all the most common calls we get. Counter surfing, pulling on leash, separation anxiety, stealing and potting. And we're going to teach you how to prevent them so that they don't happen. However, if you've got a puppy that is so smart and on top of it and already doing something that you think is a problem, we can go through the strategy on how to fix it. All right. And that's where you'd want us just set up a one-to-one -one strategy call. Claudia, if you have two puppies, you're going to socialize them separately. So if you have someone else at home or if you don't, you need to have one of them supervised or taking a nap while you take the other one. Because if you go together, they're always going to depend on each other to be there. If that's safety. possible. If you have a wagon, Claudia, we did do two siblings that we put in a crate in a wagon and we just walked them around the neighborhood like they would walk when they got older and got and was vaccinated. Car rides is another way to do it. Soft carrier versus hard carrier depends on the dog, but we, it, and how far you travel, right? If you're going to be on planes, you're probably going to want a softer Soft. one. I would do both. In cars, I like the hard carrier because yeah. you can really lock it down on the sides. But If you drive a lot with your dog and you plan on having a dog that goes everywhere and anywhere, you definitely want to have a crate that is crash tested. Right. I mean, the investment just means you have peace of mind knowing your dog is okay. We can give you some suggestions on that. Definitely. Yes, Laura will give you some suggestions. All right, so jump prevention. So why do, let's go ahead and let's test what your knowledge base is. Why do dogs, why do puppies jump? Without reading all With, of Don't read reasons. our notes. <laughs> why do you think that they jump? Why do you think your jump? puppies jump? Like your specific puppies, why are they jumping on you? To get attention. Tension, excitement, yeah, yeah. Curiosity, perfect. I like that one, yeah. And so if you're answering that, great. What do you do exactly? If I was videotaping you and your puppy jumped on you, what are you do What right exactly are you doing? What do you do? And Sandy. we get it, they're eight or nine weeks old. A lot of people- <gasps> Lori, ignore. Try to get our other dog to play with him. <laughs> I like that. Sarah, your other dog is 15. <laughs> Don't put her in that situation. Say down and gently assist down. What Tell does assist off. down mean? Is that like a pushing or you like Distract moving the them? Okay. I like it. We're getting some really good answers. You've got two choices. One, you can ignore the unwanted behavior and wait for the preferred behavior, and then you're going to reinforce that. Or two, if your dog has a behavior on cue that you'd, pre you'd prefer them to do, you would say that. So for example, if your dog is jumping and you don't want them to jump on you and you have a cue like sit, you can say sit and now their dog is no longer, your dog is no longer jumping on you. But saying stop, knock it off, get away from me, off, quit it, you know, and all of that, and they don't know what that means, is just giving them the attention that they want. So you have two choices, ignore and wait for the preferred, or two, train the alternative behavior that you want them to do instead. Which hopefully because you're in this class and you're talking to trainers, you would want to do the other side of it. So let's talk about how we can, I have an 85 pound dog and we did not manage it very well when she was young. And Yo will tell you, she has been tackled by my and dog. And knocked over. And knocked over. <laughs> I mean like full NFL mode. So practicing this early and often, you'll see, you're going to practice this on Thursday with us. 
we're practicing the puppy approaching me. So I'm taking steps away. I'm cueing a sit because she already knows this word. I'm if, saying sit when she follows me. If you don't, if your puppy doesn't know how to sit, right. you're going to wait for your puppy to sit and then you're going to reinforce, which means you're going to feed them or pet them, whatever the reinforcement is. So you wait for the preferred, you're going to ignore anything else. And after a few repetitions, you'll actually be able to say sit <laughs> while the puppy's going into a sit. We're going to go into biting in a second. And you have two puppies. We're going to talk to you in a one-to-one -one session because that is a multifaceted question. These two puppies are siblings. They're both from the same litter, one female, one male. They're both separated and trained separately. They get specific playtime throughout the day, and it's maybe three, five-minute playtimes. They sleep in separate crates in separate sides of the house. They're trained by two different people in the home, or they're taking turns. Yep. Even their bathroom is one at a time. They have like so 20 they become... minutes when they get home, the parents say, okay, you guys can spend together. And then it just repeats. And they go through everything separately because we're not raising a unit. We're, wa we're raising two, two dogs. different dogs. We want each dog's brain to work independently and figure things out. We don't want them to look and go, well, how do I do it? They're not learning. They're just copying. Okay. And I know that can be challenging, which is why a lot of people say, don't get two puppies at once. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's a big undertaking. It's a really big undertaking. So all you're doing, you're going to move around. You're going to move away. You're going to turn and face your dog. When they go into sit, you're going to reward that sit. Those of you that are doing uh, clicker or marker training, um, we're going to specifically talk about that at the very end, how you can learn how to do the marker training and you're going to incorporate your clicker training in this behavior that we're going to do on Thursday. So what you're you're asking for is a sit instead of jump. And this is going to carry on to a lot of other things. When you're, you're, someone comes into your house and they want to pet your dog, that moving towards your dog and standing becomes an, a cue for your dog to sit. We call this a greeting. But if your dog is already jumping on you, do not say sit because that is the reinforcement. That is the attention that you're giving them. So just heads up. So chewing prevention, and we're talking about specifically chewing on furniture, chewing on your slippers, chewing on underwear, socks, or yeah. usually the, the call, he keeps chewing holes in my underwear. Why, why is your underwear near your puppy? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so why do puppies chew? Um, because they got teeth and they hurt, right? Their teeth hurt their it's gums bone hurt. shooting yeah. through that soft tissue it's, it's painful. and it's a way for them to explore just like babies you don't let a baby just wander around the entire kitchen picking stuff up right you put them in, an, in a, a playpen of some kind same with puppies i don't understand why puppies that are nine weeks old have full reign of the house absolutely They're, not they've got to be supervised so when a dog puts something in their mouth, they're feeling it out. They're saying, oh, what is this? Is this safe? Is this something that I could use later? So, um, and, and it's, it, it kind of gives them some release of frustration that's going on in their mouth. Um, and if your puppy has something, we're going to talk about that in just a second. If your puppy has something in their mouth, I want you to think about whose fault is this? Because if they have access to it, it's going to be in their mouth. Just like a little kid. Every, I mean, I. So if you have kids and they left something on the floor, go, oh, that was your fault, honey, right? If it's, if it's in on their level, it is there. So you need to figure out a way to manage their access or manage your stuff. So how do you prevent your puppy from ever doing that? You use an X pen, you use a baby gate, you use a leash. And what you're trying to say is in this area, you can put your mouth on anything. In fact, here, here's a bone. That's what you want to say. That's the message that you want to say to your dog because if they practice chewing on their bone or whatever specifically thing that you put in their x pen area, they get good at that. But if you give your dog access to the corner of your couch, it becomes an addiction. It becomes the go-to thing. 
And no amount of spray or deterrent is going to stop that. In fact, we get that a lot of times. It's not going to stop them from doing what they need. Remember, you're going to spray that one spot and you know what they're going to do? <laughs> they're going to go to another leg. And that's why I say stay away from temporary solutions because that's all not, they are. Fix, yeah. You're always going to have to do that for the rest of their life. So don't even start it right now. It's just a temporary fix. Manage the access, not the taste because dogs will eat i mean there are puppies that eat poop bitter apple is not not going to face them right so i have a question on that the chewing stuff um so my pup um you know i was like laying on the couch with him last night and kept trying to you know bite my sleeve bite my hand bite my arm bite the blanket and i kept taking a toy and putting it in his mouth but he kept going for me what do you recommend i i do at that point you're the re you are a higher reinforcement than the toy that you're offering and we're going to show you in one second how to present a toy to make it more of a reinforcement than than your hand but two number two sometimes dogs towards the end of the night are so exhausted that they're not themselves and then they get into the little crazies just yeah. like a little kid, right? They don't. Oh, go he did it this morning too. <laughs> okay. But then you also look at the very end of the problem solving. Remove the access to the unwanted chew. So that Which means you. you. <laughs> okay. So either you have to go away or he has to go away, and it's your house. So let's be realistic yeah. about that. That happened to me this morning, and I was like, mm-hmm. "Oh, he's getting really mouthy," and I knew my the puppy that I have was getting tired. He wasn't, he wouldn't take anything, even food. He wanted to like chew on my sleeve and hand, but I was carrying him. So I used a toy and I just did a few seconds of it enough for him to get into an an X pen. And then I was like removed from the problem. And it's not a punishment. It's not, it's, Mm -hmm. we're not picking them up and going no. And then putting Mm -hmm. them in the crate. We're actually giving them a better option and just saying, I'm removing myself from this because I'm not the better option and I'm not going to give you that. It becomes an addiction. Just like she yeah. said, if they practice it, it's going to get worse and worse and no and amount of no horrible for you stop. too. The human just gets like, I was getting like, oh, this sucks, you know? So it's, it really, really, it I hurts. mean, they're like needles. So stop allowing them access to when they you. get to that point. Yeah. You okay, so one more question, if that's okay. Sorry, I don't yeah. need to take over. So, like, for example, this morning, we were up way too early, and I was, like, playing with him, and I was just trying to, like, rest, and he kept trying to bite me, and I kept trying to give the toy. So, instead of, like, removing myself, do you recommend at that point to put him back into his crate? Correct. And okay. I had to do that this yeah. morning. I would have how, something to chew on. How many Even minutes, he, though, he'll yelp. How many minutes were you up when this happened, was it five or 10 minutes or was it a 45 minutes already? Probably we had already gone to a bathroom break. So probably I would say at least 30 minutes. Okay. Yeah. So you could have, your dog could have been hungry too. That's what probably. Yeah. Was. I hadn't, yeah. I hadn't done so what I would yet. do is prepare a meal of like putting it in a Kong or a wobbler and then turn that over and put it in a crate. Cause you're probably still trying to expose your puppy to the crate. Mm-hmm. And, um, and put that um, put that enrichment feeder inside the crate, and now you're going to get you know 30, 45 minutes to just kind of be able to like take a deep breath and unwind. So Perfect. Sarah and Thank Midge you. started with us when they were very young and set up a one to one strategy, and she just said the set daily schedule and crate time has almost eliminated unwanted biting, and that's because we started that very early and all, made that crate her the best place in the whole house. Yeah. If you're, if you guys are struggling with your puppy in the crate, like they're not really loving it. Um, we're going to be, yeah, we're going to be talking more and more about that. I'll probably go live on our Facebook group page and just kind of talk a little bit more about that. Cause I'm struggling Mm -hmm. with that, with this puppy, I've got like five more days to get the dog to like the crate. And, uh, it's better and better. It's going in the right direction, but it's a real struggle for a lot of people. So. It made such a huge difference. I was, I had scratches. I was bleeding. She was getting my, she bit my butt. She bit my calves. What was your butt doing by the way? Well, I'm, I'm short. <laughs> I'm short. She, she's, she's huge. Big. Yeah, she's, she's a, a big, big baby. And yeah. she, and she got hops. Up, she, she got hops. She jumped up. She bit me right in the bum. 
Um, oh. And that's when I broke down and said, Julie, I'm going to take you up on this one-on-one -on -one session, which was a game changer for us. Good. She's been quiet in her crate for two hours. This is the second two hour nap of the day. Good. And, this and she's been two weeks. Three months old. That's good. She's three, three months, months old. old. We got her exactly at eight weeks and we started her day two, two I think. Yeah. Puppy class. And yeah. we've done the one to one and we're gonna um, continue on to the puppy prep class. Yeah, Thank she's you graduating. So much for sharing, yes. Sarah. That's so sweet. I if you guys have the opportunity to do the one on one and problem solve, it it really made a world of difference for us. Yeah. Thank, Thank you, so you much, Sarah. Sarah. Coming from a teacher, that's awesome. Yeah. Thank you for, for sure. all you do for the children too. So um, Laura, you have a great question. How long would you recommend for overall crate time throughout the day? Every puppy's a little different, but it's like it it did depends on the bladder control of the dog. Mm -hmm. So they usually say if the dog is eight weeks, they can be in a crate for up to three hours. Mm -hmm. If you're home all day, then we'd say probably starting with an hour to an hour and a half of crate time um, throughout the day. So you're going to go through a cycle. If you don't have a training schedule, like you don't have a potty time and da, da 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 we can make one for you and we've got templates so we can help you with that laura for the overall crate time of the day it's going to depend on the day it's going to depend on the, the dog's dog. age so yeah. we they should be sleeping 18 to 20 hours a day mm -hmm. and we're going to talk to you about how to set up a one-on-one -on -one with us to yeah. make sure that we can make the that puppy happen. that i have right now i don't have any x pen i am strictly using a crate and a leash i i can't do the X pen sometimes with the dogs because I have a dog myself and having a dog, um, having access to the sight of another dog of them moving, that dog just doesn't get enough sleep. Yeah. So they template would be great. Yep, you got it, Laura and Claudia. Yeah, we'll send that template. All right, so let's play this little video on chewing. So you've got a puppy here. And if you guys have to leave, um, please, Yeah. We, yeah. we respect your time. We are here for you. That's why we'll take our time going through the are, you Question know, what we have, and, yeah. but if you've got to leave at one o'clock, feel free to leave. The link to this class will be available really soon. So for chewing prevention, you catch your dog chewing on the corner of a table, or in this case, a wooden chair. Now whose fault is it? It's your fault. <laughs> it's your fault. That's not my fault. It's no, fault. I mean, it's their fault, but it's the human fault, right? Because if they have access to it, it's going to be in there. So mouth. here's Pearl. And again, this is a recorded video. She's 10 weeks old. She's, she's on, um, chewing on a chair and we come over with a toy at the dog's level, moving it around like a squirrel's tail. So it needs to move like this and sideways, just enough for the dog to catch that attention. That head movement is called a disengage. They disengaged with what they were in and they looked for a brief second. At that time, you've got them, you've just got to act on it. Mm -hmm. So after you get that little head movement that goes towards you, you want to make sure you move it away from the chair enough for you to get some space and figure out what you need to do next. Our prevention strategy is to put a leash on your dog so you have access to them all the time. So you'll see in a lot of the videos with this board and train, he is leashed all the time. That's how I can get some space. Like he can, so he doesn't have to always be in a crate. Use your furniture to help keep your puppy in a certain space. So this is a dog bed that I was teaching this dog to kind of hang out here instead of here. Each dog has their own space. Um, so I will tether the dog right there, but I am in the room. I am right there at the table. You never leave your dog tethered someplace, but this is a way to prevent them from doing what you don't want them to do, but see what I gave them instead or her? I gave her a bone. I gave her something else to chew on. She wants something for her teeth. It's obvious because she's chewing on wood. So saying no doesn't give her any information. Really? Yeah. She would give her an alternative behavior. And you'll notice that she didn't just shove that in her mouth. She made it interesting and more valuable. So if you're just going, well, I'm trying to trade and your puppy's not taking it, you're not making it valuable enough. Take those little squeaker squirrels are awesome. Yeah, they, they are. Great. Take them and put them all over throughout your house where you might need them, as well as medicine or mason jars. Stick some treats in there so that you have the opportunity to reinforce it, not to, to rattle it or anything like that. Water bottles like this by Claudia 
are great. You can also get your dog's attention by just moving a water bottle and then tossing it on the ground to get their attention away from what they're doing, doing so that you have time to pick it up. So for, for training purposes, we're going to teach you how to train a new behavior. We've got, we've got to find the motivation. We've got to find, um, we got to, when you're coming over to class, you want to make sure your dog is hungry. That's motivation because they're motivated, right? You want to get them moving. Like for me, I do better. So before I go live on a, on a thing like this and mind you, I don't like being on camera. I don't like having to talk into a live audience, but to do that, I have to kind of pump myself up. So it might be playing music. It might be like, Oh, high five or telling a funny story to kind of get me there. Right. Same with your dog right. offering a, a, an introduction of a, of a food for no reason kind of gets your dog like, Ooh, what, what are we doing? Um, so making sure your dog is awake, hungry and ready to go or is a way to make sure that they're motivated. The reinforcement is all going to vary from each dog. Some dogs love to play. They love their food. Some dogs love to chase. So figure out what that motivation is and you're going to use it to reinforce, meaning to repeat. You want them to repeat the wanted behavior. Now, clicker training, clicker training, that's what we are. We are clicker trainers. We like to mark a specific behavior that the dog did so that we have time to go figure out what we would like to pay them. So we do a clicker or marker training. And on tomorrow, I will be talking live on our Facebook page to give you more knowledge if you want to learn how to use a clicker or what marker training could be used for. So we encourage you to do the treat tournament before Thursday so that you can figure out what is your dog willing to work for? Why don't you talk a little bit about what that is? This is just a minute video on the puppy treat tournament. Yeah, so grabbing, you know, a variety of treats. Um, puppies, just like little kids, get really bored with their food. And just because they like mac and cheese one day doesn't mean they will like it the next day. So he's taking two different two foods. Two to eight total. And he's presenting them the same way. So be careful not to influence them, but you're going to set them down the same way. And it's up to your dog, which one they choose. It may not be the one that you think, but we're trying all kinds. This is burger versus hot dog. Which one do you think she chose? Burger or hot dog? You can tell. This is good 4th of July. Oh yeah, that's a good treat tournament for 4th of July. Burger or hot dog? And you can see that he's totally still and she's taking bites out of it. She gets that reward and then we'll remove the other one and we can try with something else. So ranking, someone said hot dog. My dog would choose a hot dog, but her dog would choose a burger. Yeah. So it's different for every dog setting it up. Like it's a March madness tournament. You go two things, battle each other, and then one moves on to the end. You can do this with your kids and set up a whole, oh, it's a, a basketball tournament. You know, we're whittling it down to the number one and then that is what you're gonna save for your puppy's most difficult tasks or for you know crate training or socialization out in the big kind of scary world. Yeah. You're gonna save that super value for later on in the time. All right, so as far as how we, what methods that we use for training, we use capturing, shaping, targeting, and luring. So just gonna give you a brief description of each. And throughout the next four weeks, you're gonna learn a little bit about each. Um, capturing is when your dog does something naturally. They're like, oh my God, I would love to turn that into a trick. Um, capturing is like taking a picture and being able to turn that into a cue. Cue is a signal that tells your dog to do that behavior that you like. Shaping. Um, oh, both two people said, is there a list of suggested treats? Yeah. I'll type in and we'll send you a link to our favorite product. Let's, we'll put it on the Facebook group page. <laughs> oh, I'd like perfect. to just feed it there because yeah. it's so much easier than doing I'll, a lot of emails. I'll send you yeah. the Facebook, um, it's on, on our Facebook link, the favorites for that we have on our website. Yeah. We use stuff that's really high quality that could be used as their food. 
So just so you know, shaping is taking bite-sized pieces and you have this like end goal, like, yo, I want to turn, I want to teach my dog to do a spin backwards. So then we would start with, well, let's see if your dog can touch your nose to your <laughs> hand. So we'd shape it. Luring is treat to the nose and the dog just kind of like follows the food or it could be a toy or something that's luring. And then targeting, we talked about last week, targeting is what we're going to be teaching you guys how to teach a nose, a paw, and a body target. Here's uh, some information for you that you guys that are having a clicker, um, we're going to call it, we call it loading the marker. We want when you're first starting to teach your dog vocabulary so that you guys can have a dialogue, you know, oh, go to your bed. Oh yeah, I know what that means. You have to have a very structured way of doing it. it it's just easier, it flows better, it's a lot faster to teach. So we call what's, we wanna to explain to you what's called loading the marker. A marker is a word or a sound, so we use a clicker, that means you did it, awesome job, let me pay you. So here in this video, we are what we call loading the clicker, we're putting meaning into that marker. So Julie's using a clicker, she's making a sound and then offering the food. So it's sound and food. So if you want to use a verbal marker and you don't have a clicker, you would do something like, yes, and then the food comes out, your hand moves, yes, and then the food comes out. That word, yes, means you just did what I asked for, here comes your food, wait a second. So when we load a clicker, which we prefer using a clicker because it's a very, very distinct sound, most people don't say it, um, you know, they're not going to be able to replicate it. You do want to make sure that nothing else in the house is going on, that your environment, your setup is very calm so that your dog is only paying attention to the one thing that you're either saying or the noise that you're making. So it's the sound from the clicker or your verbal marker, and then the reward comes. After a few repetitions, wait for eye contact. So your dog looks at you, you can mark that, and then eventually you can teach your dog's name. In this one minute and 45 second sitting, we taught this dog the loading of the clicker, eye contact, and the name in one session. This was done on the very first session with this puppy. So tomorrow I will be going live on our Facebook group page to demonstrate this and to explain how this actually works. This is part of uh, what we're gonna be doing on Thursday. This is your recall, come when called. You're gonna give your dog a treat to start and then you're gonna run away and look over your shoulder. And as you look over your shoulder, all you're doing is looking for any kind of movement. Is this a video? Okay. You're gonna look for a movement towards you and then you're gonna whip around, bend your knees and pay your dog. So she is. So you'll notice it's basically like chase at first. I'm just having her chase me and then I'm turning around and I'm reinforcing her. Um, she was too excited to take food at one point. So I was just reinforcing her with petting. So only one rule on this one. Don't worry about the jumping and the barking. You want your dog to want to come to you, right? The one rule is the dog chases you. You, you never chase the, the dog. dog. Because it's the number one problem that we come across with recalls is your dog runs away and then you run after them and they learn, oh, that was a great game of chase. Yes. So we don't want to reinforce it backwards. We want to always get our puppies moving towards us. So we're going to initiate that game of chase by being the chasey. Is that yeah. the right word? <laughs> sure. And then we decided to do this, what we call round robin. So if you have more than one person in your house, you'll see this is Yo's turn. She turns around and then she faces the dog, drops straight down. She's not bending over. She's dropping straight down to the puppy's level. Excitement. And then it's my turn. So I go up and I move back quickly and Darla comes to me. You'll start off about four to six feet away from your puppy. And then you can gradually turn this into a real recall and you can put a cue on it. 
but this is what we like to use on our emergency recall when the dog, you accidentally drop the leash or something, you don't run towards your dog, you run away and the dog will normally come back towards you. And look how excited she is it's to fun. come towards us. Yeah, it's a fun way to teach recall. And then the last one we want to talk about is if you have multiple people in the home, we want to do what's called pass the puppy, just so your dog is okay with being alone without you, without that one person. person. Um, as, as we are working with our, what, some of our reactive dogs, um, separation anxiety is a real thing. And, and it's and usually tied to one, one person. person. So if you never leave your puppy alone, not even with your own family, your dog is going to develop an unnatural obsession or attachment <laughs> with you that can turn into panic and anxiety. To the point later. where they won't even eat when you're when gone. You're there. Yeah. yeah. So this is Julie passing the puppy over to me. I mean, this puppy is neither one of our puppies, but so, but we're just showing you, you pass the puppy, let the other human give them some food as the other person walks away. You do want to practice this in the canine good citizen test. You have to leave your dog unattended for about two or three minutes with a different handler. So your homework for Thursday, 11 o'clock, you're going to bring some costumes, Halloween, Christmas, birthday, 4th of July hat, bandanas, and scarves, puppy costumes as well. Yeah, if that you would wanna, be fun. If you want to put costumes on your puppy, if you have sweaters, jackets, rain jackets, oh, if thought, you live yeah. in like Seattle area, I know a lot of people have rain jackets for their dogs, boots, socks, anything like that. Let's dress your puppy up and get them used to it now. And then you can decide later whether you actually want to do it in the long term. But bring, it, bring a settle mat or a towel so your dog mm -hmm. can relax during the breaks. Um, something for your dog to chew on. You might need to have two so you can exchange them. Um, bring your treat pouch clicker if you've got one. and um, Different kinds of treats. So you're going to do that treat tournament and we're going to find out just kind of a variety of what you like. We'd like you, this picture of this particular slide is going to be on the Facebook your private Facebook page and underneath this slide under comment is where you're going to submit your video if you'd like us to analyze it or pictures. I would love to see more field trips. We didn't see any in the last few weeks. So Home Depot, a coffee place, grocery store, and we're talking about the parking lot guys. And then I want you to practice recall because on Thursday we're going to be going live. So this is the name now. of the group. She's oh, going to show. I guess I didn't do it. Oh, did I do it? I did yeah, it at the, beginning. at the very, yeah. very beginning. So just show them the name of the group that okay. um, is at the very beginning. All right. So let's go back up to the very beginning. And that's where I will. If you want to snap a picture of this. Oh, oh gosh. And we're rewinding the. Uh, the old VHS tapes. This is what that feels like. Oh my gosh. There we go. It is called private or it's called puppy start right eight to 20 weeks old private group. So it's, if you look up is the name, you don't have the name written on there. This is the name of the group. I don't know if you can see that. I'll put it in the message <laughs> afterwards. It's called Puppy Start Right. So search on there, Puppy Start Right. You're going to see a private group run by Canine Learning Academy. So that will be what you. Um, We're taking you all of the puppy parents and putting them into one private group page because we're going to be dripping. We have our online school that just opened up the 1st of June and we don't have all the content uploaded there yet. So we're going to be posting live on our Facebook group page and uploading that content onto our school platform. You guys will have access to our school home study program. We are using this platform and this, this group to be able to practice our home study program and just kind of work out all the kinks. So um, for no cost, you guys will have access to that. Um, just the puppy one and then we've got other ones. Huh? Mm -hmm. I'm trying to get to the end because I had one more slide and it's, yeah. It's Oh, okay. It's kind of done. All right, last page right here. I just wanted to show you what I was going to do tomorrow. We have 
Once a week, we're going to try to give you a master class, a master lesson on one specific topic that we really think um, is important. And again, this content will go into our home study course. So we're going to talk about clicker training and why it's effective how to use a clicker instead of a voice marker. But if you want to just understand that it's exactly the same, it's just a little different, you can also understand what marker training is. And then we're gonna talk about a little bit about rewards. Um, it's approximately an hour long. It's Wednesday, June 3rd, that's tomorrow, one o'clock, but we'll stream it live to Facebook. It'll be there for, um, for a while, so you can use, watch it any time. So we're gonna turn off this and see if you guys have any questions and we will stay here as long as you need to answer your questions and um, go from there. So any kind of questions you have. Astrich, how are you doing with your puppy? What? <laughs> how are you doing? Ah, he's sleeping. He's sleeping. He's sleeping, good, okay. Any questions, Lori, Laura, Katie, Sandy, Sonia, Diana? Nope. No. No, I don't think so. I mean, yes, but <laughs> we'll get there. Lori, you can unmute yourself, but um, when oh, crate Lord. training, two dogs, can they be side by side? Sure. They just shouldn't be in the same crate because then it, they create a dependency on each other. Okay. You, and how, like, I know you sometimes leave the crate doors open um, for them to come and go so they can relax. So how do you make sure they feel like How old are your fosters? Again, they're two years old. Uh, one's six and one is 12. Six and 12 years old. Yeah. Okay. So how, how do they have a history of ever being in a crate? Um, just the oldest one, but not the, uh, not the six year old. Okay. So then you're going to set up a specific one-to-one -one strategy call with us because, because they're older dogs, yeah. it's going to be a totally different task than what we would do with the young puppies. So that's, that's going to be a similar, but it's different, yes. especially at yeah. six, six and, and 12. 12 they're yeah. like senior dogs technically. So it's going to be a lot longer of a process than it is for a you know, eight week old puppy. So Sonia had a great question. Can dogs be trained to walk heel on both right and left hand side? I am left-handed or will that confuse them? We do, for my dog, he has a heel and a side, which means left side, right side. So you can name which side you'd like your dog to, you know, get to. So if you want them on your right side or left side by calling it at two different cues. But also if you're not going to compete with your dog, you get to decide the side that like formal obedience says that they should be on the left, but I walk my dog on the right. She can go back and forth. So it's up to you, the owner. It's not our decision what side your dog yeah. walks on. So. so if you feel more comfortable with walking your dog on your right, using your left hand, your dog, wherever you train, that's going to be the default spot that that dog goes to. Now, if someone else in your house is right-handed and they want to walk your dog on the left-hand side, your dog will pick that up pretty quickly. Oh, I'm with. So when I walk Julie's dog, I always walk her on the left and it'll take her a second, but she'll come over to my left side and I start rewarding her there and getting that going. If you're training both at the same time, you're going to get there. Most dogs can pick it up, but it's going to take longer than if you just did one side and then you did another side. Right. So if you're the one that's going to be walking your dog the most, then you're going to probably walk your dog on the right side so that that becomes that default position. Laura, where do you suggest their crate be housed? That depends on your dog. If he's comfortable and he's quiet and he's able to relax on his own, you could probably put it, we have one out here in the living room. Um, you just want to make sure that they're able to calm down and sleep. But that can sometimes, if you have kids or if you guys are up and walking yeah. around, you, you'll probably want it out of the way in an area that you guys are not typically during the day because he needs to be napping during the day, just like a baby. 
So if you want to submit one. pictures and yeah. video of like what it looks like, we can help you pick the right spot. I did that with a couple clients and like, Katie, we can see all of your house. We can specifically tell you, Hey, okay, mm -hmm. this is where you probably need to go so that your dog is getting more calm and more quiet time. But covering them covering up. up always. We recommend yeah. that just to kind of take out one more thing, you know, the, the, the sight of all the kids and stuff. I like putting a fan on the crate mm -hmm. too, especially as an Aussie, he's got a little more fluff. <laughs> so if you cover it, sometimes it can limit, like they can get a little hot and wiggly. So I like a fan one for white noise and two to keep them cool just because I have a sheep dog and she like gets. Astrid she gets um, was, she called me uh, two days ago cause her dog was crying nonstop and he hadn't been for a few days come to find out it's really hot out there like oh, 90 yeah. degrees and so being in a crate was just too, too much, much. Yeah. so she put the air conditioning on and put the crate changed the crate around and her dogs fell asleep right away yeah um sandy how old is your <laughs> puppy again his his is sleeping today oh there's the there's fan the fan right there, you there. Go. and and just like people if we're too hot like yeah. you shift around a lot it's uncomfortable you can't sleep as well so good um how old is your puppy sandy he's 11 weeks oh so he's still very he's still quite young if he's under three months then you want to be going maybe an hour outside of the crate maximum is usually enough stimulation um, if you're, you can kind of vary that an hour to an hour and a half, but at that point I would put him up for at least an hour to two hours. Of yeah. I'm doing time. the, like, if it's feeding time, I'm doing enrichment feeding or training. Then I go outside and I'll take the dog out on a, a walk like they would do if they were really walking, but he's in a carrier. Like we went on PCH. We do that for about I mean, honestly, I do it for a long time because I've got other dogs with me. But if I was just with the puppy, I'd probably do a 20, 20 potty bed. Back to bed. <laughs> so like yeah. 45 minutes out and then back in for one to three hours, depending on the time mm -hmm. of day. Yeah, he'll sleep for two to three hours after lots of playing and eating in the morning. Good. But if he's sleeping out in the house, if you guys are letting your puppy dictate their nap times, yeah. they're not getting that quality REM sleep that they need because there's people walking around or there's light on or they're, they're wondering what you're doing. So just like you would with a baby, don't just let them sleep out in the cave. Go put them up to make sure they're having deep quality, quality okay. sleep yeah. or they're just going to keep getting fussy all day. Okay. And that's where we notice a lot of the power biting. Yeah. yeah. That helps. Thank you. Yes, yeah. of course. And we, I mean, this is something that we do all the, like our puppies just live on a cycle and yeah. it's that schedule that keeps us sane with the 50 <laughs> puppies a year that we have in our house. If we, if we didn't place them on a schedule, it would be chaos. It would be absolute chaos. Yeah. I don't know how you do it. I saw you walking the other day in the morning and I think you had four dogs one on your chest and maybe three others or two others on a leash. They're all trained. That's, mm -hmm. that's why, yeah, we don't well, just the puppy's like, not trained, the puppy's but not the trained. puppy's like, whoo, this is, you know, I, I did that every, yeah, I do a morning and an evening walk. Yeah. And in the daytime, he goes to school all day. So he's around 12 to 14 other dogs at a distance, but he's mm -hmm. getting, you know, that just, just taking a walk, your dog is awake because they're like mm -hmm. taking it all in and it's not, it's not hard on you to pick up your dog and walk around and just kind of let them smell and see. Make sure yeah. they go out in your neighborhood, not just in your backyard, because no, I had a puppy I worked with. Um, he didn't oh, even get out in the neighborhood until five months old. And now every noise outside the gate is the most terrifying thing in the she's world. So, cute. so not just for you, Sandy, I just mean for everyone needs sure. to get sure. out in their own neighborhoods to hear the cars, see suburbia and forest and kids on their bikes and that kind of stuff. I'm um, just being out in your natural environment. Yeah. And just want to show you what he's doing. He's half lying in his cool water area. Oh, oh yeah, that's a golden right there. They got to be in the water. Oh my gosh. Yeah, you've got a great <laughs> setup you've over there. You've got a beautiful yard. I would kill for that kind of space. Well, actually, we don't have much grass, but yeah, at least we have a spot for him. I so. have no grass, so. We have zero grass, yeah. yeah. 
So Laura, Katie, Astrid, Diana, do you guys have any other questions you'd like to go over? As far as the crate, um, someone was saying like where to put it. Um, we had been taking it back and forth from our bedroom to the living room um, because I had a daycare many years ago. So my other two dogs, they don't have rain of the house. They're either in this living room area or in our bedroom at night. Um, so we were bringing it back and forth and leaving it open for him to go in and out. And then now when he, every time he falls asleep, we kind of try and put him in there. Um, but we ended up just deciding to get a second crate. Okay. As far as setup goes, would you put the the one that would be in the bedroom, would that have zero total? Like what would be the difference in setup as far as? Um, you're always going to be there, right? When you go to bed, you're there, they can smell you and everything. So mm -hmm. they're probably going to sleep more soundly at night. Mm -hmm. And then the one during the day is the one that I would always cover up because you're most likely going to be leaving the house soon. One, one of these days. <laughs> but also try not to wait for, again, them to fall asleep for you to put them up. Because then if you have to put them up when they're yeah. not sleepy, then you're the mean That's mommy. That's the hard part because... I mean, it's You're, great. You should, your dog's going to cry when you put them in the crate. They're going to cry. And until you get past that point, um, it's always going to be a struggle. So it's better to do it while they're young and get on the floor, work the crate for a few repetitions, you know, like tossing the toy in there, getting some stuff in there, do it for like two minutes. And then you're going to bring a treat into the crate and then you're gonna close it up and you're gonna cover it up and you're gonna to have to endure a little bit of the barking and crying um, now so that you can get past it. They will hurt themselves later. If you reinforce the barking now, yeah. we have a dog that jumped out a second story window and that's the severity that separation anxiety causes and it all starts right now. If they right now. bark and you go get them, period they're gonna keep doing it and it's gonna get longer and longer you wanted to talk about extinction so yeah. that what we call an extinction burst it's gonna get worse before it gets better just like a little kid throwing a tantrum yeah. they're gonna hyperventilate they're gonna go mom i'm gonna hold my breath until i turn purple and if they hold their breath until they turn purple they don't turn purple <laughs> just you're gonna have to stand there and go so go for it can you hear this? That was the first 59 seconds, like just nonstop. It hurts. Yeah. It? it hurts your and heart. And then fell asleep. Yeah. So they go through one more like, and then they like, okay, that doesn't work. Okay. She's not going to really go get me. That's why it, if you go get them when they're doing that and you open the door, you even look at them it starts back over and then it'll get even bigger yeah so katie you are on a you're gonna have a really hard job over the next few days because your dog knows that you've got a point where you can't take it anymore and you're going to go get them right um it's it's not like kids guys i know with kids you don't let them cry because it does emotional stress on them it's not like it's that. not like that with the with puppies you've You've got to, they're trying everything they can to not be left alone, but we've got to help them feel comfortable with being left alone. So always giving them something to do or yeah. something to chew, put frozen veggies in there, grab a bully stick, grab some something for them to gnaw on while they're in there. And every single time you put them up, oh my gosh, there's, there's food in here. Yeah. Oh, I just, I dug in here and I found gold. Wow, that's... I, mean, I should check that place out more often and just yeah. kind of see what they could find in there. Put a towel and put some stuff in there. So you're not putting a dog bed or anything like that in there. I would use a towel for now and kind of like hide food in there. Just three or four pieces. It's not a big deal. And then give them something that they are allowed to put their mouth on. You want to show, she has the Kong like, uh, yeah. like pressed in, Pressed into the side, the bar. See this Kong? We do that in the here. very back. This is attached to the crate. We and like I, to do that in the back so they'll walk all the way in and enjoy that while you kind of close the door and cover them up so that you can transition out a little more smoothly because they've got their mouth full. Oh. 
So I would play a few little crate games throughout the day, two or three times a day, three or four repetitions, getting on the floor and uh, doing that to get your dog really just comfortable with the crate with the door open and start freezing everything. Start putting <laughs> everything in the freezer so that you have long lasting treats. And it feels good. And it feels good on their tea. So even yeah. like putting water in their kibble, putting it in the freezer, bonus. Yeah. That's a that's a popsicle. You can blend it. If you have kibble, you can blend it, put a little bit of chicken or beef broth and then freeze it, freeze part of it. Yeah. Doesn't have to be super, super fit. Puppies are, are really easy. Really easy when yeah. it comes to food. You could basically, even Greek yogurt, you just put like a little finger in there and they'll go in there. Just because it's new and novel, they'll want to explore yeah. it. Yeah. I Does do that... have another question. Yeah, so, please do. Uh, so I have little small kids. And so obviously he, um, our puppy thinks that he is equal to my son and wants to always try and like be on his level and get at him and stuff. So what would you recommend as far as like how the kids should react with them? The, the kid should have a specific role. Be careful. You have an Aussie doodle, right? No, we have, um, uh, oh, yeah. Like a pointer. We, we actually just did a DNA test. We don't know it's a rescue dog. Okay. But a pointer, maybe pit, terrier. We don't know. Well, a Maldi breed for okay. sure. Yes. I would keep young kids away from a puppy all the time and give them specific things that they can do. So the enrichment project should be something the kids do. If they have access to Google, you can have them look up on Pinterest and find different games that they make in the kitchen projects, and then they are able to present that gift to the dog. Uh, they should play with toys, but when the puppy starts going after them, that's when we manage the puppy or we manage the kids. Someone has to be separate. We cannot let them practice that because little kids don't know how to control the ow or yeah. the stop or pushing them off so as soon as that starts happening you start separating whoever needs to be separate whoever needs to be out of the room needs to step out i would teach a get mm -hmm. a getaway which is a we call it a get i would teach that is from the human first and then that would be the first thing the kids do is they sit on the couch and they practice get and tossing awesome. food so the dog is always running away and the humans, the adults, are teaching everything that comes back, and the kids are teaching the dog to always move away. Yep. Okay. Yeah. Perfect. It also Thank just you. teaches them to stay out of the way when kids are like, running around as well. I do it with the vacuum. I conditioned my dog to stay out of the path of the vacuum, vacuum because I just kept tossing things behind me. So now she's always behind me when I'm vacuuming. Oh, that's so good. it just keeps her out of the way. And we don't want them to never interact with the puppy. We just want them to wait. To wait. <laughs> and we want the puppy to be fully, um, you know, house and mouth trained before we can cause. Is that your dog? Bound? No, that's my son. Oh, <laughs> how old are your kids, Laura? Three and seven. Mm. Okay, so the seven year old, I would recommend like doing reading time, computer time, or whatever it is that he's doing, I would have him next to the puppy's crate mm -hmm. and while the dog's crated. So they're smelling each other, they're right next to. We can actually show you how to teach the, your, your kid's body language yeah. and mm -hmm. look for that. So then they're reinforcing the wanted body language too. Perfect. Setting up a playpen for the puppy so your yeah. kids can be next to them but not have hands and mouth. A lot of puppies bite out of frustration. They're being picked up too much. They're being pet too much. They're tired. They're fussy. They're biting for every kind of reason. So if that's happening with your kids, they're not going to understand right. like, oh, they're tired. So just teaching them why the puppy Ooh, is biting and to and grab puppy. out, you know, when it happens, we need to manage it right away. Yeah. Okay. Awesome. Thank you. Absolutely. You're welcome. All right, guys. Any other questions before we head out? Astrid, I saw the, the pop mono with the puppy. This, oh my gosh, so cute. So cute. The um, high five. Ay, patita. The high five. <laughs> yes. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Estás haciendo los dos palabras en inglés y en español sí. con dos, el izquierda y derecho. Uh -huh. Oh my uh, gosh. So she's <laughs> teaching her dog paw in both languages, meaning two different paws, left and right. Yeah. Marrow five, five weeks, six weeks. She's five, he's five. Say semanas. Five weeks. 
five or cinco weeks. semanas. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Marrow bones, Sandy, your puppy is still very young, so I would just be always supervise before yeah. you leave them alone with anything. And I would also take out the raw, just because it might upset his stomach at this age. I love feeding my dog raw. My dog loves marrow bones. At, yeah. at an older age, but if you, you go from all cooked to some raw, he's probably gonna have an upset tummy. So just kind of be really mindful about that and supervise, supervise, supervise. Antlers, bully sticks. There's a Nyla bone that are all puppy, mm -hmm. puppy good. For power chewers, just go ahead and go on to those. The, the, with a pity mix, they're a mouthy breed. So, Terrier, you know, yeah. antlers and buffalo bone, buffalo horns or femurs, that kind of stuff can be really, that can save your arms and legs. <laughs> All right, guys. Well, have a wonderful rest of your day. Bye. Bye. Thanks for showing up. Bye. Bye. Bye.